welcome to another episode of The Deep Dive. We are finishing up our study of the book of Jude today. Uh, my name is Brad, joined again by Dan. It's become like a regular thing. Hi, everybody. <laughs> anyway, um, hope that you had a fantastic Easter weekend uh, celebrating. We finished this series uh, a week and a half ago or so uh, at Calvary at our Mid Rivers and our St. Charles campuses. And this week, um, yeah, we're just releasing this last little bit from Jude. I've had some technical difficulties when it's come to locating memory cards to be able to uh, uh, distribute this at an appropriate time, but it actually worked because of Easter. We weren't going to do an Easter-specific deep dive anyway. Uh, but today, yeah, we're finishing up the book of Jude. It's been a, a fascinating study for me because we, we've kind of gone backwards at the very you know end of the letter because in doing so, we're able to pull in a lot of the meat from earlier in the letter. Um, Those are just kind of good handles uh, to use. But uh, Dan, just big picture before we dive into things like textual criticism and how do we have confidence over what we're reading when we open up our Bible, um, what's this series been for you? This series for me, um, not to be cheesy, but a labor of love. Um, It touches on the uh, the essentials. What is what is the church? Uh, what does it mean to be an individual with faith mm-hmm. among you know a congregation of individuals with faith? Um, I I really to me the the verses twenty two and twenty three about what to do with those who doubt <clears throat> is very important to me mm-hmm. um, because I I think early in life for whatever reason. And no judgment, maybe they had great reasons, but I felt like a lot of the Christians I knew early in my life looked at doubt as um, something to fight and those who doubt as enemies. Mm. Um, And I I think I just feel like I've grown to a more honest place of like doubt is actually a really important process Mm -hmm. in faith Mm -hmm. um, and undercutting that creates something else. So I love that. But the... um, I think sometimes the, the my hypothesis is what we have in our New Testament made a lot of sense to the people who read it uh, first. So Jude starts by saying, um, I, I wanted to write about common salvation to celebrate, and then he quickly like uh, he quickly says, but I need to talk about this other thing. Mm. We wouldn't do that today. Mm. We would say, let's remember our common salvation. Jesus saved us. He keeps us. You know. Uh, this is how we do our thing, and now let's talk about the really, um, the really, uh, you know, strong warning that I need to share. Mm-hmm. Jude goes the opposite. He does the warning. He does the church. He does those who doubt, and then he does Jesus. So, um, you feel like it'd be it's like oftentimes stepping into a movie that's multiple movies into a series where. Uh, take take Avengers yeah. uh, Endgame, for yeah. instance, right? You can have no, you can know nothing about any of the movies, any of the story, um, like leading up to Endgame, and still have a fantastic experience yeah. enjoying the movie, maybe getting some of the jokes, liking the special effects, yeah. and kind of getting to the end of the story and and following it. But it's much richer if yes. you know yes. all of the nuances of the characters and what's gone on to get them to the point that they are. Yes. And like Endgame, Jude is enough to maybe want, like encourage someone to go dig deeper Mm -hmm. to learn more of the story. Um, Let's do something that's a a brief aside. Brad, you want to turn on the light, the on-air light? We have um, some friends in our hallway yeah. that might be yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure i did okay but let me check <laughs> sorry we we're having a, a little bit of a actually it sounds like a very fun game and if if i were not um uh you know harnessed in here i might i might hop out so one of the things um that jude lets us do and see and part of why i fell in love with the letter to jude um is because a lot of the skills we learned in seminary about language study mm-hmm. uh, are very relevant in yeah. Jude. There are some things that show up very clearly in our English text, and there are some things that are a little more uh, buried, and they raise questions of mm. how, how do we have confidence in the English translations that we're reading and confidence in the languages, the, the Greek mm-hmm. uh, behind the New Testament that we're getting our English mm. from. Um, because there's layers here. Uh, the scriptures have been translated going on uh, 2,000 years now mm-hmm. for the New Testament, 
and much longer for the Old Testament. Translation is part of our story. It's part of faithfulness of telling the story in every generation and in every place. But at the end of the day, translation is always an art, never a science. It's not actuarial. You know, we don't have uh, always a word over here in mm -hmm. Greek that means uh, that that finds its equivalent in English. So, yep. and, it, and we and we see this even in modern languages. If you've yeah. traveled, um, you know, overseas or gone to a country where you know, yeah. you're speaking a different language, and there is a uh, one example would be so Josh Credo. He's one of our, our missionaries. Yeah. Uh, he serves in Czech Republic, and yeah, great guy. Uh, he had been uh, over there for a couple of years. He was home on a furlough so several years ago. He and I were sitting down for lunch at a Ruby Tuesday because uh, he wanted a, a big burger and all you can eat salad that I guess you know only in America, but and uh, only at Ruby Tuesday. <laughs> and only at Ruby Tuesday. Uh, R.I.P. Um, but anyway, we were talking about. I was asking him how like language was going, and for him because he had to learn a new language and. Yeah. And, uh, and they speak. And they speak Czech. Okay. Czech. Yeah, they speak Czech. Um, and the and he does English clubs. Like that's kind of cool. one of his like handles for his ministry is their students like learning English is a value all over the world. And yep. so parents are like, hey kids, go go to the English club. Uh, don't believe the Bible, but like learn English. Go, go right? learn English. Yeah. And uh, one of the the concepts that he was very. Uh, that he recognized very early was that in Czech, there's no equivalent for the the phrase ish. Really? Right? So whenever you atta uh, attach the ish, yeah. you know, to like you can make anything mean whatever you want. It's really yeah. a very helpful category That's to right. have, ish. Um, but it was just an interesting thing that he didn't have a direct way to communicate that concept that involved yeah. that was that was involved a very short word. Yeah. And so I think that that, you know, whenever we come to the original languages when we come to our English translations, there's a similar practice that's that's happening. Oh man. I bumped into that. Um hey, y'all might know uh Jaron. Uh Jaron Shad helps he leads worship mm -hmm. sometimes uh in the big room, but he also uh leads the vine and does uh worship with our, our fuse student mm -hmm. ministry. Um Jaron says words that I thought that I knew. And when he says them, I'm going like, wait, I, I did not know. Uh, what's that that movie? Vance uh, does that too. <laughs> oh, man. Yes, our, our St. Charles campus pastor is an incredible fountain of new <laughs> new meanings for old words. It's that line from Princess Bride. What is that? What do you? What? Oh, I don't think that means what you think it <laughs> That's means. That's right. Why do you yeah. keep saying that? Why do you that? keep saying that? Yeah. I'm really glad someone told me thirsty changed meaning. Um, yeah, at least helpful. among younger audiences, because I would have I would have kicked that one yes. uh, and stubbed stubbed my toe there. Yeah. So it's not different, mm -hmm. right? The I, goodness, we're separated now by thousands of years and distance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just that the Greek language has changed. I mean, we are speaking the English language, which, um, to my knowledge, didn't exist when the Greek language was no, no, doing it its came thing. from your. Uh, your Anglo-Saxon, like, yeah, even like English is interesting in that um, the w it's it's the way it's developed is it's it has pulled words from so many other languages. Yeah, so you have like the Germanic languages, you have the right. um, um, the Romantic language, right? And so right. all of these have you can kind of trace their origin. English, it doesn't work that way. No. And so I also think that even in this discussion, words change meanings. I mean, yeah. language is dynamic. That's right. And so while you can always say, okay, well, what's it say in the dictionary? Well, it's like, well, what dictionary are you looking at? If sure. you're looking at a dictionary from 100 years ago, it's going to have completely different sure. words and different meanings. And so That's right. it kind of is why it's also important that you know we, we ask the question, and we'll get to this probably in a little bit too, of like, why are there so many English translations? It's yep. because... I mean, every generation kind of requires a new, yeah, some new translation work. I think so. I think so. Um, so let's let's go there. Um, yep. Let's ask the, ask the question this way: um, How can we? How is it that we have confidence in the English translations that we have? And for what it's worth, in my mind, anytime I'm talking about translations as a group, I'm thinking of some of the the best accepted. So we're talking um, ESV, NIV, NA, NAS, uh, the New American Standard Version. Yeah, there's a new um, one, the C, CSB. 
Sure. CBS. Christian Standard Bible. Yeah. Is that a derivative of Holman Christian Standard mm-hmm. from a few years ago? So, you know, there are some main translations, and there are other ones. There are things that individuals have taken on yeah. or other projects. But um, really, looking at the, the main group, how is it that we have confidence that those are relaying faithfully to us what's in the original language texts. Yeah, so it's a twofold conversation, right? It's to have confidence in the English translations. We also need to have confidence in the Greek, you know, and in the That's right. That's the, right. You know, and we'll and we'll go there um as kind of a, a sure. point two or point two B. Sure. Um yeah, so the English translations we can have confidence because well one, it's not just one person. Who's doing the translation? Well, that's right. Translating yep. committees, right? right? It's it's committees, and oftentimes these committees are created by um, publishing firms. Um, they're backed by publishing firms, but the conversation doesn't start with the publisher. There is a need that arises um, within the community for a particular type of translation or particular type of work, and so you have committees. So it's not just single individuals; it's committees, it's groups of people who are. Uh, esteemed, noted Bible scholars. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they, they know their stuff. They know their theology. And they've proven that in they've other spheres. They've proven that in yeah. other publications and other spheres yeah. in their own backgrounds. Um, so it's a very, like, there's a lot of accountability there. Yeah. There's a lot of dis- discussion. Yeah. Uh, the other thing is, is that these um, committees don't just take an English translation and then another English translation and another English translation and then make a better version based on those. They that's go right. back to the original text. That's right. And they go they go back time and time again and that's 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 their background and that's the the process. Um yeah. So I, I guess yep. that, that's that's my que- that's my answer to that is how can we yep. have confidence? Well we have confidence because the people who are put together to do the work, yep. um, they they know what they're doing. They're they're Bible, they're theology experts, they're also language experts, yep. they're linguists. I mean that's that's their it's what they do. Yeah. And there's some incredible resources that not only study like words in the Bible and what mm-hmm. they mean, they study what words in the culture of the day meant. Yep. Um, some of the most useful resources look at the way words at the time were being used. It's how mm-hmm. we understand that Paul with uh, Evangelion, the mm-hmm. good news, was taking something known and doing something yeah. new. Even Paul's words for grace and faith yeah. um, are were known words that were not connected to the Christian faith, mm-hmm. but they explained something. Yeah. Something that stood out to me at Covenant was... That's uh, Covenant uh, Seminary. Covenant Seminary. Are, yes. Yeah. Yes. That's uh, where we went to, for our grad school. Um, Cheers. Was words have meaning. Mm-hmm. And there's kind of been an evolution even in how word study is done um, yep. to where originally or long, you know, a while back, a couple generations ago, word studies were essentially, hey, let's take all of the uses of a particular word in the New Testament and let's just compare them next to one another. It was like algebra. Yeah. If this word means X, what are all the possible what are values possible? of X? And then yep. consider all of those possible values when you're translating. Yep. And words have meaning, but they have meaning in relation to other words. That's right. And so kind of the way uh, word study and and grammar studies have gone is as opposed to saying, hey, let's just look at all the possible ways we can um, understand this word because you have to understand it to be able to translate it. Right. It lets now say, hey, in the New Testament, this author usually uses it in this way. And the the whole library of options is, is helpful background information. But we want to compare how this author uses this word in this way when it relates to this word. And, that's true. Uh, so anyway. I, that's very and true. And again, that's, that's just a, a peek behind the curtain. Um, you know, we ask, how do you have confidence? Yeah. Well, that's how you have confidence is, that's right. is that there's just this huge, there's a lot of calculus involved. And if, yeah, if you want to get, I like that word calculus, because if you want to geek out a little bit. Um, when you get into the Greek language in particular, and we're, we're focusing on New Testament, I think, because we're. We're looking in, at well, yeah, we're in a New, New Testament. Testament. Yeah. There's uh, also a whole lot more controversy with New Testament than with Old Testament. That's true, but there's also a lot more that's known. Yep. And so what's beautiful about yep. the timing of the Jesus story, it happened when the world was ready to start telling a universal story mm-hmm. uh, that would that would echo. So the language was very widespread. It was mm-hmm. ubiquitous. It was well known. Uh, people were interacting with it. We could relate that maybe to English today, like mm-hmm. just like our friends in Czech have a value for knowing English. Greek was was a, a language that was needed. Um, Helen is a man. 
That, that's right. Hel- Hellenism. Uh, 50 points if you can email Brad uh, with a, de- a good definition of Hellenism. But um, it, the confidence is. Doesn't have anything to do with hell. No. Spoiler no. alert. Yeah. Or Helen. Um, yeah. Anyway. So the the confidence that we have, yes, it's the 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 understanding of the scope and the use of words. Um, but some of the confidence is also built into the beauty of the Greek language. Mm-hmm. The Greek language was highly pliable. Mm-hmm. You could do, um, unlike Hebrew, which was a little more structured and more like code, uh, where you were getting you were getting um, definite words and then understanding their meaning. In Greek, you get words that do a lot of poetic things. Mm-hmm. Um, the The number of words is is much much larger mm-hmm. than Hebrew, uh, less than English. Interestingly, mm-hmm. um, but uh, one of the things that just always fascinated me is um, what's the right word? Prepositions in mm-hmm. in Greek. So. Preposition that most often gets translated of uh, is fascinating mm. in Greek because it can it can be doing all sorts of things. Mm-hmm. It can be talking about one part of a whole. It can be talking about origin story. It can be talking about catalyst. Um, and so, yeah, as we as we return to the text over and over and over, we understand it, and then we understand it better. Then we understand it better because we're starting to get. It's not we're not honing down on meaning. Meaning we're getting the three dimensional picture mm-hmm. of the meaning, and that's really really beautiful. So when then those groups of scholars get together, having studied, having continued to develop their understanding, then having conversation and accountability, yep. what they end up writing down is something that um, it has been poured over. Uh, yeah. with pretty much every facet of the human, I yeah. think. And so what we're getting then in our English text is something that we can read with confidence um, because like good communication, it's doing something. Yeah. It's and intentionally I, sharing and I do a story. think that one of our goals for reading anything, whether it's the Bible, whether it's C.S. Lewis, whether, I mean, whether, whether it's anything is, is, just, is, re, is approaching the text uh, charitably, yeah, and I do think that oftentimes this is one of the things that I that I hear when I read, like when somebody you know they write a book and it goes viral. Um, we live in a very skeptical culture, yes, right, where it's hey, show me your work. No, we don't. <laughs> show me your work, prove it. Um, I'm going to doubt whatever this is until I know categorically that yep. it's 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 true. And when it comes to translations, especially with um, some other social issues, uh, there are assertions made that particular translation committees um, yep. chose particular words with an agenda. Yeah, uh, inclusive language. Inclusive language. Man, uh, exactly. men, humankind um, versus men and women. Yeah. Yeah, that's and right. I don't think we should eliminate the the human nature, the group think. Um, preconceived confirmation by, I mean, all of these, these things, we, we shouldn't throw that away, but at the same time, um, I, I do think that whether it's a translation you like or prefer or one that yep. you don't prefer as much, uh, we need to have a whole lot of charity for the committees and the men and the women, um, who That's know, right. faithfully, um, we're, we're putting to work to, to That's make right. these. Uh, Two two questions, uh, just kind of midstream before we transition. Yeah, to and the we're at twenty minutes, and textual. we're still just going through our goals. Ah, uh, that's all right. So we'll, uh, if we need to, we'll double, part, double part down. two. Yeah, right, part cool. two. Um, so <clears throat> for you, mm-hmm. for you, would you rather have a translation that does uh, some of the interpretive legwork work for you? Uh, or one that is going to be more close to like the original way, like the the way that Greek speakers yeah. and Hebrew people speaking Greek may have thought, and then you do the interpretive work. What would you prefer in your English translation? Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I think what I would prefer is wanting wanting to know what I'm dealing with. Okay. Right. So if it's if if it's a translation that has done more of the legwork. I want to know about, I want to know that Yeah. if it's a translation that is trying to stay true to word order and kind of a wooden reading of the text, I want to, I want to know that so that yeah. then I can do the work. Yeah. Right. And so, um, 
I, yeah, that's how I would prefer it. I, I think one of the one of the beauties of of translations is they serve different purposes. Yeah, but oftentimes we don't know that they serve sure, different sure. purposes. What about you? Uh, yeah, I, I man, I didn't expect you to turn that question on me. Mm. I was going to point out that at the <laughs> beginning of every <laughs> sorry, while I gather my thoughts, yeah, yeah, at the beginning yeah. of every English translation uh, Bible, if if you go to it, there's a preface from yep. the committee that did the work. Yep, and you can find out where they were coming from and what they were seeking to do. Yeah. So okay. So I will answer the question. I think for me, I would prefer something that represents the thought of the original writer. Mm-hmm. And me do the interpretive work because, you know, the 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 lens that I'm reading through continues to develop uh, as I grow yeah. older and gain more experience. Yeah. So I would rather be t- be returning to something not wooden, but something that represents original thought a little more clearly. So, like for me, I don't have a problem when it says, you know, man for mankind. I I don't. Mm-hmm. assume that means like patriarchy is supreme. Mm-hmm. I just understand that that's the way they would talk about it mm-hmm. back in the day. When mm-hmm. it says God is a he, I don't get confused in my mind that God is spirit. Like God is yeah. n- not really yeah. gendered. I would assume that that's, yeah, yeah. A, that's a spirit, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. that being spirit is different. So um, so the, the second question I, I have is... Uh, that's, a, that's, a fair, that's a fair answer, I think. I think one of the things that we need to be able to do is... Well, here's one of the reasons I like it. I I like the idea of, hey, I'm going to be reading from the ESV for the next 50 years. There's familiarity with the wording and the pacing and the text um, because I know what the ESV was trying to do, and I think think it's going to hold up for 50 years. Um, But also, as we understand, like our theology develops, if we're reading a particular book of the the Bible and um, it's trying to do some interpretive work for me, and my theology develops in a way that's going to counter that. That's now I'm creating difficulty um, for future me. Yeah. So no, that's right. You know, it's interesting. My grandparents loved the King James version. Uh, now, people that I heard preach when I was young did not do well by what Scripture was trying to say yeah. in using the King James. But my grandparents, interestingly never had a problem with doctrine or praxis. They always did well by that text. And Mm -hmm. I think there's something to what you're saying. Um, So I wouldn't ever affirm that one version is the only version. There are some like uh, churches that are like King James only in that. I I actually think that that's uh, hurtful, Mm -hmm. but I also don't want to say that King James shouldn't be read. I I think the the danger comes when we say only. We also shouldn't say everything on the shelf is a great one uh, to go pick up necessarily without understanding what it is, where it comes from. So for you, what's your top three versions? Like if someone were listening and they were like, hey, I want to get a physical copy that I don't have. I feel like we need like intro, like music to top three. Just to, anyway. Um, (laughs) There you go. Uh, Yeah, no, it's a great question. Well, and I I help lead, um, so do you, uh, Tuesday night classes, yep. right at our Mid Rivers campus, yep. and that's a that's something that we talk about with you know facilitators is yep. what translations are we encouraging? That's a question that I feel is like, hey, what translations should we go off of? Um, I I really like the ESV. I mean, that's going to yep. be my 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 top. It's going to be my go to. Um, part of it is is there were several covenant professors who were involved in the translation mm. and development of the study bible that's right uh, the ESV study bible and so i have a high level of familiarity um, both with a lot of the people who were contributors but also um, that's what we used in grad school and so like there was a um, now not we didn't use it exclusively we were encouraged to use a wide variety of, of yep. translations in our assignments um, but yeah so that I, I like the ESV it does a good job of trying to maintain thought for thought. Um, so it's not as wooden as something like the uh, NASB, for instance. Yeah. Um, but the whole goal is, hey, can we provide a faithful, you know, a, a translation that's very faithful to what the original writers were seeking uh, or intending to say in their context? Yeah. So the ESV, uh, the NIV, um, for, for a couple of reasons, I think it does take it does make some interpretive claims uh, here and there um, but it does a good job of following up on the tradition 
of, I mean, ultimately that goes back to the King James Version. A lot of the language that we have that we very clearly identify, you know, the the wording of John 3.16, for instance, goes back to Tyndale's original translation, and the yeah. NIV has done a good job of maintaining uh, that for the sake of the, the Protestant people of God. Yeah. Um, it's also, you know, it was... You got to remember too when the when the NIV came around, it was the first like real wide translation that was used uh, in churches, um, other than the the new King, you know, the King James version, really. Yep. And so, um, I think it's it's a really accessible translation uh, for most readers. It's one yep. that you know, if we think of communication as an act of love and an act of service, yeah. Um, the and I, using the NIV, I think, is a good application of that because it's something that's going to be familiar to the person who's in the seat listening. So when, yep. I, when I preach, I often preach from the NIV, even though my study is hmm. often in the ESV. That's interesting. Um, yeah, so those are my, my top two. Uh, and then I, I will go, it's a little controversial. I'll go there, though. Uh, the message is probably my third. What? Right? Um, but it's, it's, it doesn't replace either of the first two. That's it's, right. I'm making a very intentional yeah. choice to yeah. look at the message. Yeah. Um, because I know the work of Eugene Peterson and his yeah. committee, um, their heartbeat behind it, and it it gets me out of my what I'm looking for and and points to things that maybe I wouldn't have otherwise. I think that's fair. Um, yeah, if I were to put my I, ESV for me um, is the best chance to hear the text. And it, those guys at, that were involved in that, they were well studied on the most recent literary understandings of language um, in, in, in translation. And that matters a lot to me. NIV, I find interesting, but I, I read NIV, um, the NASB, New American mm-hmm. Standard, uh, Holman Christian, or the, yep. or the new, the, the CSB, um, kind of all on like a tier two. Two. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying ESV is so far yeah. superior, but each of those is doing something intentional. And this is where we're going to be accused in the comments of like just being the uh, homers, the home, oh, yeah. yeah, hometown. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I I'm still paying my student loans, so I, I better be proud. There you go. Um, all right. So <laughs> the NIV d- shoots for dynamic equivalence, mm-hmm. which means great. that it is sometimes trying to say things in its own voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that's where those interpretive glosses or jumps come. Uh, the, uh, NASB is a little like Yoda mm-hmm. and unfortunately for us that works somewhat in the Hebrew. It does not work well in the Greek Yep. in the Greek word order mattered to give emphasis. Yep. Um, but we put, em- we do emphasis in a different way. And so it's a little, in, in my mind, it's just a little misleading to say, oh, it's closest to the original. Mm-hmm. Be- because the way we speak is much sure. different. Holman Christian uh, message, I-, I like those because it is a tradition that's speaking into something, and you do get that chance then mm-hmm. to see. And then King James. I uh, King James is based off of the uh, original Latin mm-hmm. translations of Scripture. So there's these these whole interpretive histories that are represented in yep. the King James. Um, anyway, so... I, it, but can, for can me, we, it's ESV, yeah. and then it's the others, and I know we're yeah. running up against time. No, no, that's good. Um, we're just going to hit a place where we can hit pause and then cut together, cut, cut back. Can we talk about the NLT for a minute? Yeah, New Living. Yeah, yeah. so the New Living is one that uh, I remember in middle school, high school, I had a, a New Living yeah. version. It's one that off like a lot of people use it. It's very it's, popular. It's a very popular because yeah. it's, it's so readable. Mm-hmm. What's the NLT seeking to do? If I remember right... NLT is dynamic equivalence uh, aimed at readability. Mm-hmm. And so it is trying to say things truly, like purely in the voice of the reader, yeah. um, things they're familiar with. But that's often very helpful because sometimes we have to circle the meaning like a spiral and we mm-hmm. have to get closer. So um, much love for any reading or memorizing the NLT. Okay, so Brad, we talked a lot about the uh, English translations, mm-hmm. but one of the things that we really shouldn't miss is uh, the question: Why do we have confidence in the Greek, the the Greek manuscripts that we have yeah. that sit behind that? Because if those are wrong, then what we're translating 
can't be right. But we affirm that everything in our Bible is uh, is true mm-hmm. and is uh, without error. Mm-hmm. Um, and those are two pretty big assertions for mm-hmm. something that has been translated over and over and over again. So um, in your mind, can you loosely describe where does our confidence in the uh, – I'm going to use the word original manuscripts, yep. and we might need to parse that out a little yeah. bit. Uh, but in the original Greek, where does our confidence come from there? Yeah, so it's a great that's a great question. And, and yeah, the Greek is a little bit more um, – part of that is the, the Old Testament was such an oral tradition that it was passed on. It was yep. memorized. It was – yeah. So there's just less, less questions regarding the Old Testament. Yep. Um, and this question is important to me because – so we spent time, you know, both of us as, as youth pastors for a significant amount of time. And – parents uh, would would just come to me with all this anxiety and fear mm. um, because they're sending their kids off to these secular universities and they have yep. uh, images like the movie God's Not Dead, right? Sure. And this, the, the antagonistic uh, philosophy professor uh, who's going to try to, you know, beat into their heads. That the antagonistic tenured philosophy professor. Tenured philosophy, philosophy professor, professor. Um, who's just going to beat into their heads that... Uh, the Bible is not reliable. You can't, sure. you know, and I don't know. Oftentimes we, yeah, we put, we create this caricature for ourselves and I'm not saying that doesn't happen at the universities because it, it does. Um, yeah. But I think we need to be able to have rational responses to that. Yeah. And a lot of times when we just, you know, we, we make a whole lot of assumptions all the time. Um, but yeah, that question, how can we have confidence in the original languages? Um, how can we not be scared uh, to encounter arguments from from scholars like Bart Ehrman, right? Very sure. popular scholar. And I think I think just informing, hey, how do we get the Bible that we have is a helpful one. So your original question, uh, how can we have confidence uh, that in the original um, text of Scripture? I think that's yeah. an important uh, piece, the original yeah. text. Uh, we don't have those. Right. And we shouldn't be scared of that fact. Right. Like we should be able to say, yeah, we don't have any of the originals. Why don't we have like, the originals? We because don't have like the parchment that the, Paul wrote yes. on that he sent. Yes. What do we have? Yeah. And so, well, and, and the reason we don't have those is because paper back then just didn't last. Yeah. Right. Um, so what we have is we have copies of copies of copies mm-hmm. and we have a lot of copies. Mm-hmm. And so uh, if you, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but um if you look at throughout history of books uh, or writings that we that we have yeah. things that are uh, universally acclaimed to not be questioned, uh, things like Homer's Iliad. That's right. Right. Um, there, the Bible, even, even copies of Shakespeare, which was written much later much than later. Homer. Yes, we have so few copies yes. of certain things that we believed to be original. Yes. And so we have copies of copies of copies. There's, there are 10 times, I'm, I'm making up a stat here. I'm admitting that I'm making up a stat, <laughs> no, but it's, I don't think it's an unfair uh, if I, if I'm, grasp. If I'm recalling, like the, the Homer's, the Iliad yeah. was like in the 300s and the, the copies of the New Testament or pieces of it, yeah. 14,000, so, something thousands. like that. Right. right. So it's, it's a significant amount. Now, the amount that it's been copied says something about its authenticity, about yep. its message. Um, even, and, and here's the thing, we didn't have printing presses back then. And so like the copies that we have, they're all hand done. Yeah, that's right. So there were, there were people whose professions were to copy scripture, to, right. to make copies of it, to send out to, so that it was more widely available um, so that churches would have it mm-hmm. as they're, you know, launching churches all across the world. Mm-hmm. And and yet then there's other questions that come up. Well, well why are there different – well, why were there di- – you know, why are, why is this copy use a different word than this copy? Why is this word spelled this way? And and we could geek out and talk through – it's called yeah. textual criticism. is the process of trying to get as close to the original as we can yeah. uh, through comparing – all these different translate, uh, all these different copies, and yeah. so one of the ways they would do this is they would um, mark the location that a particular copy came from, and so you could even see how throughout history, particular copies that might have come from yeah. uh, this area in North Africa differ a little bit from all of the other copies that came 
closer in the area that it was originally written. And yep. so you could even you could even through a process of of uh, elimination even say, okay, well this this one probably isn't the correct one because it only really showed up in this particular area. And yet to be which, which means so like let's let's turn this into a, 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 a like a, a graph. Yeah. You know, let's say you have uh, f- one copy comes into uh, St. Charles. We'll mm-hmm. just pretend St. Charles used to exist. And the scribes in St. Charles made 10 copies. Yep. But one of the scribes made a mistake and sent their copy to Chicago, and the other nine mm-hmm. went other places. Well, that Chicago copy gets copied again mm-hmm. and again. And so um, it's, not a, it's not a lot of thought, you know, if somebody looks at the 200 eventual copies. Yep. To see that, oh, everything that came out of Chicago goes back to one mistake that was made at the previous place in yeah. St. Charles. Yeah, something about a goat and Steve Bartman and something <laughs> else. I'm making a Chicago Cubs <laughs> joke there. Um, but you went there. So, pre, pre-2000, <laughs> yes. whatever that was. Yeah. So so anyway, uh, just the process, though, of that should give us confidence. That's right. Um, because it's not like we're making these assumptions and we're just taking something at face value. Is there is a process. Yeah, that's um, right. And that's why whenever you do read your English translation translations, a lot of times this this is actually one of the one of the things that concerns me about the amount um, that we use our phones to read the Bible. Now, I, this is a beautiful tool, and I'm glad that yep. we have it. And the ability to read Scripture and interact with Scripture is greater now than it ever has been. Yeah. Um, but you don't the footnotes and some of the other cross reference mm. material isn't as Easy, easy to find and easy to That's you have true. to click a link, you have to get off the page, go somewhere else. When you're bored with what the preacher's saying, <laughs> there's there's the internet. Yeah, not... you don't have the maps that you can, you know, look yeah, at. That's true. Uh, but anyway, in, in our English translations in the footnotes, right, you often yep. will see something like some early manuscripts say That's right. blank. Or um, John eight. Some manuscripts don't have don't verses one through eleven. It, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. And what that is is it's not the English translator uh's intent to dupe the reader. That's right. It's the it's the translation committee's um move of integrity that's right to show, hey, listen, we want to put all of the we want to put all of the evidence here. We have that's great right. confidence that this that this portion is scripture. So here's what's cool, and yeah. this was something that that I loved. Uh, actually, in studying Jude, I got a, a taste of it. Mm. Um, it's not just the English committees that did that. Mm-hmm. When you go back and you look at the original languages, there's, uh, to my knowledge, there's two major um, Greek compilations. There's the Nestle Allen that's been, mm-hmm. goodness, I think they're in their 28th or 29th mm-hmm. edition. And then there's the, uh, is it United Bible Societies, UBS? Yeah, the, uh, yeah, UBS, USB, UBS, UBS. Yeah, they um, both have, you know, they they do the work of textual criticism mm-hmm. to create Greek uh, compilate. Like I'll call them compilations, but um, libraries. Yeah, like, yeah, right. And as we'll see in a minute, it's uh, synthesis might even be a better mm-hmm. word. Everything that we believe that we know, we we bring it into, into one, and they have entire books dedicated to where the other all the thousands of copies how they factor in mm-hmm. even to the translation of one mm-hmm. or two words mm-hmm. so in jude it's really interesting in verses 22 and 23 you'll see one of those footnotes there mm-hmm. especially in the esv and what we have is we have um, a known literary pattern in jude he likes to use triplicates but for whatever reason in the oldest manuscripts which often get you know the older the better Mm-hmm. Um, in the oldest manuscripts, verses 22 and 23 come out with only a two-part sentence rather than a three-part sentence. And some later manuscripts come out with a three-part sentence rather than a two. And so as I was looking into this, I, I found it fascinating because it illustrated how um, honest and yet how difficult textual criticism is. There's lots of factors to wrestle with. Mm-hmm. And in this particular case, it's not like crystal clear which reading should go forward. Most translations go with the three-part sentence because Mm -hmm. Jude demonstrates he does three-part sentences. Yep. Um, And they're not making that up. There are manuscripts that have that. And and the beauty of God using human authors, right, to to say things in the way that they would say things, to to use their own personality even, is just a really beautiful thing. 
and God using scribes to pass this on, mm -hmm. you know, across geography and chronology yeah. is part of the miracle yeah. in my mind. Um, what's amazing here, and this is, I, it was funny, I got so into this for a time, I was like, like steam was pouring out of my ears <laughs> and I felt like the weight of like, gosh, if I take this wrong, like I'm misrepresenting scripture. Yeah. And it was a comment, I, I think, by a commentator that settled my heart that pointed out um, there, there is no uh, difference in understanding or in point to read it as a two-part or a three-part, the oldest yeah. manuscripts or the more reliable ones. Um, the exercise was great to go through it, to wrestle with what is Jude saying, but there was no difference in meaning and... Um, that led me to another statistic that blew me away. But the text of our Bible, we hold in the original languages with, um, I think it's over 98% accuracy. Mm -hmm. And the one point whatever percent where we have things like Jude 22 and 23, mm -hmm. the meaning does not change. Mm -hmm. So we're not, we're not like, <laughs> we're not bumping into things about like, does the Bible really say that Jesus was born, you know, from Mary or yeah. that he died on a cross or rose from the dead? We're talking about, did somebody add the word and, you know, in this particular yeah. place? And those are really significant things because we all know what it's like to um, be misunderstood for inconsequential things yeah. and to be misunderstood for yeah. consequential things. Um, so it's not the challenge that, that the text we have is unreliable. That's not really a legitimate thing mathematically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> our, our text is very strong. Historically, it's incredibly strong. Um, it, it's actually, interestingly, part of why I'm a believer hmm. uh, is the reliability of our New Testament. Yeah, um, that's so. a great that's a great point. Um, we, I'm sure everyone everyone's listening has has had a time where they've been reading, and when they've they've read, their eyes have jumped from one line to, and they've skipped a line, or then they've accidentally repeated a line. Yeah, right. Yeah. And, and again, human scribes were doing all of this, yeah. and so most of the the issues were little problems like yeah. that or misspelling a word. Um, or, or not liking the word that they heard. Yeah. It's really funny. You can see that yeah. some scribes tried to clean up the language as they were going. Yeah, because um, even then they know they're working on someone else's copy. And yeah. so like I'm trying to correct someone else's copy because I know like these scribes, they're not just like paid secretary. Like they are people who know the word, yep. like, so they know what they're listening for. They know what they're rec looking to recognize. And so if they, no, oh no, that's not a right word. It was actually this word. And then uh, anyway, there's just a lot yep. of, of things there. But I, I think your point, Dan, of, of the meaning of the text, the meaning of, of uh, the story, like that's not, that's right. not changed. So um, all, all of this adds up uh, to, you know, how do we use language study today? Mm -hmm. uh, you and I have both gone through uh, enormous amounts of energy to learn the basics of Greek language, um, yep. a few uh, advanced skills. But, I mean, in reality, we deal mostly in our English translations. We can work backward. Um, sometimes yep. we'll try to impress each other by bringing our, our Greek, <laughs> you know, translations. And, um, yeah. So how do we use language study today? Well, Jude is a, a beautiful place. Um, and so let's point to these things as, uh, as keys. Uh, one of them is we look for words that obviously meant something to the author. And one of the words that means a lot to the author is the word, uh, it's in the Greek, agapetoi. Agapetoi. Uh, I think I said that about as American as I can. Agapetoi. Agapetoi. Um, <laughs> Agapitoi is translated in, in many translations as beloved. Beloved, um, and it's really, and that's that's really a true sense of that word. Um, it's just kind of an incredible thing that all throughout and everything that he's writing, mm -hmm. um, it, it, to him, this is relational. Mm -hmm. You know, he is writing doctrine, he is writing practice, but he's writing to the beloved, mm -hmm. um, and that stands out. And then compared to the beloved, there are these who. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a lot of participles involved in describing mm -hmm. the false teachers, um, as well as uh, the people caught in between. Um, what's interesting about the people caught in between, this is verses 22, mm -hmm. 23. We do have a word that shows up, and it's uh, – let me, let me pull it up real quick. Uh, it's hus. Uh, and who's again and who's it that's it's a um what's the right phrase an, an article is it, is that correct like 
the or yeah. those. That's an article in English. Yeah, so you have the indefinite or the definite, right? A and yep. indefinite, if you want to be more defined, the. Yeah. What's really cool in Jude and what we see in the original language is he intentionally isn't he is intentionally talking to the beloved, mm-hmm. and now he's talking about who's. He's mm-hmm. talking about them. He's mm-hmm. talking about others. He's mm-hmm. talking about those. Um, so it's kind of beautiful to see uh, how he describes the situation. He loves triplicates, mm-hmm. um, and that's a really cool thing to see somebody, e- even though he's writing. Um, Ben made this assertion yesterday, and I think he's right, that this is a, a sermonic letter. It mm-hmm. was a, a written sermon. Mm-hmm. And so like a good sermon, you know, there's three points mm-hmm. often. Mm-hmm. Um, it's cool that he does that. But my favorite that, that shows up is versus... This sermon can be read in about eight minutes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Out loud. Easily. With effect. Yeah. Just saying, we usually go around 30 or... <laughs> the original maybe we should uh yeah actually do comment below we yeah. would love some yeah. some input uh verse 20 and 21 could you read that yes. um in the gr- so this english. is the the esv english verses 20 and 21 you said mm-hmm. but you beloved building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the holy spirit keep yourselves in the love of god waiting for the mercy of our lord jesus christ that leads to eternal life that is a beautiful example of how um, language study, English translations, mm-hmm. and the original language, they all play. Mm-hmm. Um, in English, a lot of times, we, I, I think we value clarity and efficiency or color. We, we do one or the other, rarely both. Mm. The Greek is really interesting because uh, Greek words can show what part of the sentence they play just by their word endings and their composition and the way they're constructed. So... Um, as, as we're looking through this, what we see is we see three participles, mm-hmm. uh, participles of situation or at- attending participles, participles of d- describing. Participles are those words that often end ing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, going. In, in English. Yeah. That's right. I, I'll, I'll be eating mm-hmm. later. That, yeah, that's a participle, right? Yeah. Cool. I hope to be eating later. Yeah. Here, what we have is three participles, and then we have one one word that comes out very, very clearly. Uh, it says, but you, in the love of God, te re sate, mm. uh, which is uh, an imperative in the original. Uh, can you describe what kind of word in a, or verb an imperative is? Yeah, an is? imperative is one that it functions as a command. Mm-hmm. It's instruction. It's, hey, do this. Yeah. Um, so, and again, this is where, where language is important. You look at something like Matthew 28, where we translate it often, go and make disciples of all nations. That's actually a participle, but it mm. reads as an imperative. And this is where yep. uh, when you get into word study, there's all these different categories for how different words are used yep. and the nuances. And there are some that are participles that have that command yep. kind of thrust as well. Well, yeah, they, they, it has some of that, mm-hmm. but how much of that? Yep. What's crazy and beautiful here. Um, is even to this day, we argue, uh, you know, about what church should be. Mm. Is church a place we're supposed to be encouraged, right? Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, sure. Uh, church should be a place of prayer, of spiritual things. Yep. Well, yes. Uh, church should be all about the story of Jesus. And y- yes, yes. Uh, what I love here in Jude, though, is that his command is in doing these things or by doing these things. Maybe it's through doing these things. Through doing these things and doing these things. Keep yourself in the love of God. Yeah. That's the goal. Yeah. The goal isn't to be a great Christian. The goal is to be a kept person in the love mm. of God. Um, as we are building ourselves up in the faith, as we are praying in the spirit, as we are uh, waiting for the mercy of Jesus. Yeah. The point is so much more, um, gosh, it's so much more human than it is religious. Mm. You know, to be in the love of, of another mm-hmm. um, is an experience that uh, we can't replace. Um, it's an experience that we feel, that we know with our mind, and we choose sometimes with our will. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's, I, I think he's saying all of those things. Like, yeah. But the goal isn't to be, you know, it's not be a good Christian. The point is keep yourself in the love of God in these practices, uh, these habits, these commitments. Hmm. That's really good, man. Well... 
uh, this has been a long, long episode. I don't know exactly how long it's been because we had some uh, different recording difficulties that we'll see on the edit side of things, how uh, how it turns out. But uh, I don't know, it got me thinking like, oh, maybe this is the, the next apologetics class is how do we hmm. trust what's in the Bible? Um Anyway, it's been a good discussion. Hopefully it has been enriching uh, for you as well as you've listened. I just want to say thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, just supporting this project. Uh, we uh, work Bible geeks and language geeks, and so it's fun to uh, have an excuse to talk about those things. But also it, it does matter. And uh, we want, as Calvary, we want to be a people that is that are faithfully reading our, our Bibles, that are curious about what's in it, um, and, and is seeking to understand and live it out uh, as best we can as we wait for Jesus to return. So if you have any questions for future episodes, we'd love for you to email us at podcast at calvary.church. Um, you can find resources for this Jude series on our website, calvary.church slash Jude one. Um, also we have other resources, podcasts, uh, things on our website, calvary.church slash resources that you can check out at any time. Hope that you have a great week and we will, uh, catch up with you again next week as we start our new series. What do I do with my life? Go in grace and peace. Thanks for listening to the deep dive, a Calvary church media productions podcast. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts.